As many of you know, the world headquarters of Encounter Books is not here in this building for, yet. But it's located on the island of, in, of Manhattan in the irregularly beating heart of the city of New York. As I've had occasion to talk with many people tonight about New York, the sentiment seems to be universal. It's not what it once was. With every passing day, it seems, it descends a little further into chaos, incivility, filth, and violence. A principal reason for this is that Ray Kelly is no longer police commissioner of the city. <laughs> Among many other distinctions, Ray was not only the longest serving police commissioner in the city's history, but also the only person to serve two non-consecutive terms. Now, I want to go on record tonight to suggest that Ray please make history again and become the first person to serve three non-consecutive terms. Come back, Ray. We need you. In the meantime, in the meantime, I'm uh, 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 delighted that you are on hand to introduce Heather McDonald, the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and scourge of the feckless and politically correct wherever they congregate and shiver. <laughs> Champion of beauty and civilization and tireless supporter of the men in blue. We are very proud at Encounter to have published her book, The War on Cops, a few years back, and you will find a copy of that waiting for you later this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Raymond Kelly. Well, thank you very much, Roger. And it's certainly my honor to introduce Heather McDonald as tonight's honoree and recipient of the Jean Kirkpatrick Prize for Academic Freedom. This is an award which Heather has truly earned by putting her own reputation and her own body on the front line against the forces of intellectual intolerance and left-wing violence. There are few scholars or journalists working anywhere who are as brave as she is. And it's no exaggeration to say that Heather McDonald is the de facto spokesperson for law enforcement in America today. There are thousands of police officers who would certainly agree with that. At a time when public intellectuals trim their sails to the winds of extreme political correctness for fear of being canceled, Heather sets her course by the true north of truth and rough seas and hot air be damned. Heather McDonald is the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor to City Journal. She has written incisively about such disparate matters as immigration, policing, homelessness, drug policy, the terrible state of higher education, the myth of implicit racial bias, and just to keep us guessing, the opera. <laughs> she earned her bachelor's degree from Yale, where she studied English literature, and considered a career in academia as a literary critic, but turned away from a profession that was increasingly in the grips of doctrinaire academic unfreedom. Heather received her law degree from Stanford Law School and clerked for Federal Circuit Court Judge Stephen Reinhardt, Jimmy Carter's last appointment to the bench. As the author of uh, New York Times best-selling book of 2016, War on Cops, which you're all gonna get a copy of, Heather coined and popularized the phrase the Ferguson effect, 
following the civil unrest and anti-police violence that emerged after the justified shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. The Ferguson effect describes a rise in crime in cities that have experienced significant, significant public agitation against law enforcement. And the media, by promoting the disinformation that innocent black men face a significant threat of murder by police, has prompted public safety officers to disengage from discretionary enforcement activity. Now, this disengagement has emboldened the nation's criminal element. This thesis has been borne out by the sharp rise in crime that followed the George Floyd riots of 2020 and demands for, from even mainstream politicians to defund the police. As the 2018 book, The Diversity Delusion, took aim at the obsession of race and identity that has captured the media, academia, government, and boardrooms. With a relentless rigor and insistence on looking at what the data really says and not what advocates want it to say, she pierces the shroud of rhetoric and wishful thinking about the so-called disparate impact in our country. Her work is a cold, sober shower of fact about diversity, equity, and inclusion. The new woke trinity, which the progressives demand we all kneel to. For 30 years, Heather McDonald has steadily spoken up about the lies that infect every corner of our culture. Lies based on an ideology of resentment, ugliness, and frustration. She is routinely the object of protests and threats of violence, and has been forced to address empty auditoriums in order to ensure her safety. At the same time, she is a fearless journalist who doesn't hesitate to explore the darker corners of our decaying urban environments in order to get the truth of what's happening there. Heather is a truth teller of the highest order, and we need her insight and wisdom now more than ever. So please join me in welcoming Heather to the stage here. Wow. Commissioner Kelly, thank you so much for that magnificent, generous introduction. As Roger said, the last time that New York was actually safe was when Ray Kelly was running the show. And given how New York City residents voted in the last election, hint, I don't mean NYPD blue, it's not clear that we ever deserved him. So I agree with Roger, please come back. Now, with a topic like free speech, the current moment undoubtedly calls for a reference to Elon Musk and his heroic attempts to liberate Twitter from the tech censors. Unfortunately, the only thing I know about Mr. Musk is that he built Roger Kimball's car. <laughs> so I thought I'd begin by invoking a different American hero, the woman whose name graces this wonderful award. In 1982, student agitators prevented Jean Kirkpatrick from speaking at several campuses across the country in protest against U.S. policy in Central America. Heckler silenced Ambassador Kirkpatrick at the University of California, Berkeley, and at the University of Minnesota. Imagine the aggression needed to silence Jean Kirkpatrick. Smith College told her that it could not assure her safety during a commencement address, so the address was canceled. Well, you may be thinking, business as usual. In fact, the reaction of campus administrators and even students themselves 
to the shutdown seemed to come from a different world. The chancellor of the University of California announced his embarrassment that his university had, quote, succumbed to mob rule. UC Regents demanded that an apology be sent to Kirkpatrick. Even the group that organized the Berkeley protest, Students Against Intervention in El Salvador, admitted that the heckling had gone too far. The group had no intent, it said, to curtail the speech of those who, quote, disagree with us. As anti-military protests spread across the country, the American Association of University Professors, the United States Student Association, and other academic bodies denounced the use of the heckler's veto and asked faculty and students to reaffirm our traditional commitment to freedom to speak and to listen. Fast forward to 2015. A group of black Yale students scream at cur and curse at Yale sociologist Nicholas Christakis for what seemed an eternity, preventing him from addressing them. Be quiet, shrieked one. You are disgusting. It's not a debate, screamed another student. Merely invoking free speech, said yet another student, creates a, quote, space to allow for violence to happen on this campus. Yale's president, Peter Salovey, rushed to express his sympathies, not with the beleaguered Christakis, but with his tormentors. Quote, their concerns and cries for help made clear that some students find life on our campus profoundly difficult. If this were not nauseating enough, Salovey thanked the rabble for offering him the opportunity to, quote, listen to and learn from you. What a president. This episode proved a template. In 2016, Emory students demanded protection from a few Trump 2016 slogans that had been chalked on campus sidewalks. Trump's name exacerbated the, quote, unsafety of minority students, they said. Emory's president validated what he called the students, quote, pain in the face of this perceived intimidation. The chalkers would be tracked down and subjected to the, quote, conduct violation process. And Emory would implement yet more diversity bureaucracy to protect students from harmful speech. In 2017, hundreds of UC Berkeley faculty called for canceling a talk by provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos on the ground that its content would, quote, harm students. The faculty got their wish. Black masked anarchists and beat and pepper sprayed would-be attendees, hurled flaming rockets at the auditorium where Yiannopoulos was supposed to speak, and ransacked city businesses. Afterwards, several Berkeley professors lauded the rioters for shutting down the event th through what one professor called, quote, very efficient attacks on university property. Getting beaten up by left-wingers, we learned, or losing your livelihood is not a, quote, harm, to borrow a phrase that today's academic left recognizes. In 2018, University of Chicago pro professors circulated a petition denouncing a planned debate between Steve Bannon and a business school professor. The debate would, quote, threaten the safety of people of color on and off campus, the signatories said. The debate never occurred. In June 2022, the dean of the University of Pennsylvania Law School asked the faculty senate to ideally fire tenured law professor Amy Wax because of the, quote, severe harms she had inflicted on the Penn community with her challenges to campus orthodoxies regarding racial preferences, immigration, and sex differences. Apologies for offending speech are now all but de rigueur. In 2021, an astronomer retracted an article proposing a method for predicting scientists' future research impact. The project was said to conflict with equity. Groveled the astronomer, quote, I now see that my work has hurt people. I apologize to you all for the stress and pain that I have caused. The authors of another retracted study comparing male and female mentors in STEM expressed, quote, deep regret for having caused pain. In August 2022, the president of the American Historical Association criticized contemporary history writing for imposing a presentist lens on the past. 
he seems to have been surprised by the resulting uproar. Within two days, he had apologized for the, quote, harm the article had caused to colleagues, the discipline, and the association. He would hope to, quote, redeem himself by learning and listening. Good luck with that. His days are numbered. The private sector has become as eager to prevent alleged harm to its employees from contrarian speech. In 2018, Google fired computer scientist James Damore for having suggested in a memo that males and females have different interests and personality traits, who would have thought? These differences, Damore proposed, helped explain why Google's engineers are not 50% female. Heresy. Damore had to go because he had, quote, hurt Google's employees, announced the CEO. Booksellers are disappearing books. Payment services are blocking donations to disfavored commentators because those books and those commentators allegedly harm vulnerable victim groups. The Biden administration is bringing government's vast resources down upon, quote, disinformation. Scott Atlas will tell you about that. So what has changed between the early 1980s and today? The conquest of every mainstream institution by an idea that Ambassador Kirkpatrick memorably identified in 1984. The progressive left always blames America first, she said in a GOP convention speech. Kirkpatrick was referring to foreign affairs, but she would not have been surprised by the spread of the blame America first instinct to every aspect of domestic life and indeed to the entirety of Western civilization. After all, she had invoked Jean-Francois Revel's warning that a civilization that, quote, feels guilty for everything it is and does will lack the energy and conviction to defend itself. And so today, the elites themselves are waging war on meritocratic standards, on our civilizational inheritance, and on the West's unparalleled accomplishments all in the name of atoning for what is said to be America and the West's unique racism and cruelty towards the so-called other. The blame America first instinct lies behind the war on speech. The novel justification for today's censorship is the maudlin claim that dissenting speech harms favored victim groups. The reason they are so easily harmed is that they are already barely surviving in the maelstrom of oppression that is allegedly the United States. So vulnerable are these victims that they can be struck down, nay, even unto death by ideas they don't like. The democratic establishment labels those disagreeable ideas hate speech. If you think that Americans have the right to decide who crosses their borders, you are engaged in hate speech. If you think that doctors should be selected based on their scientific knowledge, not based on their race, you are engaged in hate speech. If you think that sex differences are written into our chromosomes and cannot be changed by fiat or by castration, you are engaged in hate speech. And hate speech, the new dogma goes, may be banned since it is not really speech, but rather conduct, assaultive conduct, against the marginalized. This definitional shift is at the core of the contemporary push for censorship. So how do we restore our freedoms? Well, we could try to give the left-wing establishment a crash course in the revolutionary breakthrough that is the First Amendment. Our academic elites believe that the only speech that deserves protection is speech with which the left agrees or which the government deems true. These opinion leaders portray the constitutional ban on censorship as a ploy used by the majority to maintain power rather than, as Frederick Douglass understood, a key protection for minorities and dissenters to break up illegitimate power. They have no appreciation for the marketplace of ideas and the difficult dialectical process of truth seeking. But it's gonna be hard to get those propositions accepted as long as America and the West are cast as racist oppressors, and as long as alleged victimhood is the most coveted status in elite circles today. So we are gonna to have to take on the lies about American civilization directly. 
We must assert at every opportunity that the unique features of the West are its passion for discovery and exploration, its hunger to systematically understand the workings of nature, the development of limited government, and the concepts of tolerance and of equality before the law. The West is not distinguished by domination and exploitation. Those practices have been present in every human society and are still the norm in many countries today. Only the West created the principles with which to rein in the human drive for abuse of power. Every battle against the West that the left fights today in the name of equity is being fought with Western intellectual ammunition. We must assert at every opportunity that high standards, whether in academic achievement or public behavior, are not racist. And when we are called racist anyway, for standing up for meritocracy and the rule of law, we must never ever, as Jane Kirkpatrick understood, apologize. Thank you. Thank you.